Thank you so very, very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your warm welcome. And Bill, I thank you for that very, very kind introduction. I cannot tell you how pleased I am to be with you this evening, but I need to say to you, it was a close-run thing. <laughs> and uh, late last night, I alerted uh, my uh, associates in Washington that they might have to secure another speaker. And then this morning, I watched the hours go by with many conversations taking place. And finally, I just called in and said, I'm heading to the airport. I'm out of here. I'm gone. I'll be in Ohio. In the invocation, some kind words were said concerning the young men and women of the armed forces who do go in harm's way. And some kind words were said about those who may possibly have to go in harm's way in Haiti. And I hope you will say a prayer tonight and over the next couple of days for the delegation that is going down there, President Carter, Senator Nunn, and myself. And I hope that your prayer will be one for reconciliation and peace and that we can solve this crisis in a manner that is proper without the loss of a single Haitian, American, or other life. Let that be our prayer for the next two days. It certainly will be mine, and that's what I will be trying to do over the next few days. Bill, you said uh, we leave at 11 tomorrow. You know more than I do. I mean, <laughs> when I spoke to President Carter this afternoon, he said, leave early because you got to come to Atlanta to get me. I am very pleased to be your 11th lecturer. I salute this very, very wonderful program, and I applaud the work that you are doing in the name and in the memory of that great American Congressman John Ashbrook. I must say, though, that as I reviewed the names of the previous speakers, you know, my whole life flashed before my eyes. There they were, Reagan, Bush, Cheney, Quayle, Weinberger. Baker, Thatcher, and others. And almost all of them had one thing in common. They're all Republicans. <laughs> yeah. Un until last year, when you, when you started a new tradition. Last year, you had the Right Honorable Baroness Thatcher. And this year, you have General Sir Colin Powell, KZV. <laughs> but I still have to note all of those Republicans wondering if somehow in this uh, group there is a belief in uh, identification by association. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm really privileged to have been invited to continue this uh, lecture series and to follow these most distinguished uh, lecturers that you've had in the past. And frankly, it was good to be remembered. You know, I've been, I've been retired for a year. And until earlier this afternoon, some memories had begun to fade. Um, and I'd really been trying to live a fairly quiet life. But last Sunday, it was kind of brought home to roost to me when Alma and I went out to uh, a movie on a quiet Sunday afternoon, no kids or grandchildren running around our house. So we caught one of those four o'clock movies when the prices are less, you know what I mean? <laughs> and after the movie, we came out, and we went into the Supergiant, and we got some, some food to take home for dinner. And we went out to get in the car, and I let Alma get in the car, and I closed the door, walked around, and a charming elderly lady pulled up in her car, and she was getting out of the door. And it was one of those situations you see very frequently in a parking lot with somebody trying to get in, somebody trying to get out, without the doors hitting each other. So I waited as the lady got out, and she looked at me, and she says, oh, I've seen you. I, I, I know you. you I, I saw you. I've seen you. I saw you on, on television. Oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and uh, don't, don't tell me. I'll get it. Oh. Yes, ma'am. And so I waited five seconds. <laughs> 10 seconds, and, and she wasn't getting it. <laughs> but she, she wouldn't turn it loose. And uh, finally, because it was becoming a little awkward and embarrassing, I said, uh, oh, ma'am, I'm, I'm General Colin Powell. 
And she says, no, that's not it. And she, <laughs> and she walks away. And so I'm, I'm standing there, and, and Alma reaches across, and she says, Colin, get in the car. Let's go home. <laughs> You, I mean, you've got to accept that it's, it's quite a transformation to go from being chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Armed Forces of the United States. What a great title. Senior military person in uniform, top of the pile of the most powerful armed force in the world, bar none. And then it all comes to an end and the next day, I'm a spouse. <laughs> now, I had been a spouse for 31 years, but I'd only moonlighted at the job. <laughs> and suddenly, filling out visa applications, spouse, full time. I mean, there, there it was, the 30th of September of last year, president, vice president, presiding at my retirement ceremony, my beloved friend, former President Bush and Mrs. Bush, come to attend and sit with my family, not with the VIPs, Barbara holding Alma's hand. All of my other friends in gathered from around the world. Dan Quayle was there with Marilyn. Glorious day. All the troops were lined up. Bands were playing. Jets were flying over. Medals were given. Warm words were said. The Army Band commissioned a new march in my honor, the General Colonel Powell March. We had a three-hour receiving line. And then finally we went home and had drinks with our family and then the day came to an end. And then the next day, the 1st of October, I came downstairs and Alma was in the kitchen. And I walked over to her and she turned around and she said, the sink stopped up. <laughs> so? A few days later, uh, I don't have any clean shirts. Go buy some. <laughs> How come after a week and a half, Alma, we never seem to eat at about noontime? He said, for 31 years, you haven't been eating here. You're not going to start now. <laughs> I discovered. I discovered I'd become a child care center when my daughter-in-law, about 10 days in, said, oh my God, he's there all the time. <laughs> and so my five-year-old grandson, Jeffrey, gets dropped off with uh, abandon. And one of the real joys of retirement has been really the opportunity to stay home and to have a five-year-old dropped in your lap as his mother races out the door. Um, and for him to say, uh, Poppy, can we go swimming? Or Poppy, can we go down the hill on a sled? Or Poppy, read me a book. And for the first time in decades, through three children and now my first grandson, there is no meeting that has to be attended. There is no phone call that has to be made. There is no crisis that has to be dealt with. There is nothing more important in my life than to drop whatever it was I was doing and be poppy to a five-year-old and hopefully give him some memory of his grandfather that will sustain him long after his grandfather is gone. That's the joy of retirement for me so far. People say to me, though, ah, well, poppy, you got to miss it. Come on. Until a couple of hours ago, you missed being in the middle of a crisis. You must miss having armed guards and an armored limousine, your own fleet of airplanes waiting for you, satellite radio at your side. You got to miss all that. You got to miss testifying before Congress. You got to miss being interviewed. <laughs> you got to miss being interviewed by Sam Donaldson. Oh, I don't, I don't think so, no. Don't miss it at all, because when I stepped down as chairman, that door closed. Next door opened door that allows me to spend time writing my memoirs, and spend time with my family, and when the memoirs are finished, then other doors will open. That's the magic of this country. Doors are forever opening. And I tell youngsters, never look back, never wonder about what was behind you. Always 
look forward with anticipation to that next door opening. The only thing you should do about the past is relive the old memories and keep in touch with old friends. Always much more exciting and productive to look forward. I had a great life as a soldier and that life is now behind me. I loved every day of it and I was good at it. And as I go around talking to audiences, especially audiences of youngsters such as the wonderful scholars that I spoke to earlier today, I make a few simple points. And that is one, in your life seek that which you love doing and never stop till you find it. I found it right after college. I found it in college, be a soldier. Once I found what I loved and what I did well, and very often they will match, then give it all your heart and all your soul and all your energy, but never stop seeking that which you love doing, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, because that is what will give you happiness in life. And the second thing I tell my young friends when I see them on campuses is make sure that in addition to giving all your energy to your profession or your career or your trade, whatever it is you do for a living, make sure you're giving something back to your community. Make sure you're contributing to the society which gives you this opportunity. Contribute in a way that makes you a worthy family member of that society. And also remember to raise a good family because at the end of the day, when it's all over, the only thing you can leave behind are your good works and strong and loving family, and strong children who will build on what you have done. The Army allowed me to do all that. The only thing I do miss is putting on that uniform sometimes. And I especially miss being around the young men and women who wear the uniform of the Armed Forces of the United States. It was hard to take that uniform off seriously. I was a soldier for 35 years, three months, 21 days, and as we say in the military, a wake up. And those 35 years of service could really be divided into two unequal parts. The first part, the first phase of my career, roughly 28 years in length, was rather simple for me as an infantryman to understand and know what I was required to do. We had a military strategy that was straightforward, coherent, understandable. It was part of a national security strategy that was straightforward, understandable, and coherent. And it was so straightforward that it could be explained with a single word, a word that I as an infantryman could understand, a word that the nation could understand. And that word was containment, the containment of the Soviet Union, the evil empire, my old boss and your dear friend Ronald Reagan used to call it, and the containment of the ideology which fueled it, the ideology known as communism. That policy of ours of containment existed when Eisenhower signed my commission as a second lieutenant in 1958, gave me 40 soldiers, sent me to Germany, placed near the Fulda Gap, said guard this small section of the Iron Curtain, don't let the Eighth Guards Army of the Soviet Union come across. 28 years later, Ronald Reagan signed my commission as a lieutenant general of infantry, gave me a corps, the finest corps in the United States Army, 75,000 soldiers, sent me right back to an area in the vicinity of the town of Fulda, a slightly wider section of the Iron Curtain. The mission was Powell, 8th Guards Army of the Soviet Union, right across from you, don't let them come through. Even an infantryman could understand that mission over time. Vietnam and Korea and other crises came along, but even these regional crises were fought out within the context of this great struggle between East and West, democracy and communism, that we called containment. And ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, the Soviet Union was a wonderful enemy to have for an infantryman or for a people or for a strategy to be, to, be directed, to be directed against. It had villains, Stalin, the KGB. It threatened us in ways that were clear to understand. Many of you, as I look around the room, were old enough to remember Khrushchev coming to the UN, taking his shoe off, pounding it on the table. We will bury you. We will bury you politically. We will bury you socially. We will bury you militarily any way we have to, because we are presenting ourselves as the new value system of the future, the Soviet Union and communism. It had a massive army. It had alliances such as the Warsaw Pact. 
It had to be contained. And if necessary, containment failed, we had to be ready to fight them. The failure of containment would result in the loss of our way of life. It might result in the outbreak of World War III. Containment had to work. It wasn't a myth. It wasn't something generals made up and admirals made up. It was true. There was such a battle that had to be fought, and we had to be committed to that battle. There was a myth, though. The myth was on their side. They actually, actually believed they could prevail. And that turned out to be the myth. Our strategy, containment, was based on our strong belief that we had the better system. A system based on the existence of a divine providence that inspired us. America and our way of life was not some historic accident. We believed in a divine providence. We believed in democracy, in market economics. We believed in individual liberties. We believed in the individual and not the state. We had a system based on values, based on ideas, ideas that had been developed by the ancients, that had come down to us through the ages of the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment. We had 200 years of Jeffersonian experience with this system. Surely this was the better system. Surely this system in due course would prevail. And until it did, then containment was our strategy. Containment was our unifying systems theory to deal with and understand and respond to a dangerous, dangerous world. So we had our alliances, NATO, Korea, Japan. We built the finest military force the world had ever seen. We helped weaker nations defend themselves. We created a military industrial complex that took 6% of our national treasure every year to sustain. Lord help us, we developed 30,000 nuclear weapons in order to deter their more than 30,000 nuclear weapons. It was terrible, frightening. It was also static. It was measurable. It was predictable. It was the known. We could see it. We could understand it. We had a theory of strategy that could be explained and understood. And I served in that environment for the first part of my career. It dominated most of your adult life. And then it all began to change. And the second part, the short part, the last seven years of my career began. For me, the change began during that period I worked for Ronald Reagan as his national security advisor. Things were happening in the Soviet Union. This new fellow, Gorbachev, was there, and he spoke of glasnost, openness. He spoke of perestroika, restructuring. Openness, allowing ideas come, to come in, ideas that certainly were more powerful than any army. He's talking about restructuring a political system and an economic system that simply wasn't working. He said he was going to reform the Soviet Union and communism to make them more relevant to the 20th and 21st century. Ronald Reagan was a genius in being able to respond to this overture from the Soviets. But he was more than a genius. He was a great leader, a man who could respond to the Soviets from a position of strength, military strength, value system strength, economic strength. And he was willing to take chances. He was willing to trust, but he was always going to insist on verification. And I remember when this all came home to me one day at a meeting in the Kremlin when I was with George Shultz, meeting with Gorbachev and his associates in April of 1988, getting ready for the next summit meeting. And we walked into the hall of St. Catherine, this beautiful yellow and white czarist hall with the most brilliant crystal chandeliers hanging down. And we sat across from each other. And Gorbachev was going on and on trying to convince us, this is not a trick. I'm not fooling you. I'm not trying to take advantage of you. I am going to reform the Soviet Union in ways you cannot believe. Believe me. And out of the corner of his eye, I think he noticed my skeptical expression. I was not a diplomat or a politician. I was a soldier. And he looked at Schultz and said, Mr. Secretary, Cold War is over. 
And then he glanced at me and he said, Generali, you will have to find a new enemy. I thought to myself quietly and much later that night, why now? I'm only a few years short of retirement. <laughs> what did I do to you? Didn't I play my role all these years? Why now? I'm not IBM or GM or anybody. Leave me alone. <laughs> he was going to rip out from underneath me and you and our strategic system and all of our military plans the basic assumptions upon which they had rested for the previous 40 years. Should we believe him? Was he telling the truth? In 1988, we weren't sure. By the time I left the employee of Ronald Reagan and went back to the Army, I had seen enough to convince me that the Army had to start changing. And when I became chairman, I knew we had to begin changing. You all saw it, too. First, the collapse of the Berlin Wall in November of 1989. Who can forget that night when people were clawing at that wall to pull it down with their bare hands and sledgehammers? The freeing of the Baltic states, the freeing of the Eastern European countries, the collapse of the Warsaw Pact, that great alliance that served as our planning factor for four decades, gone. The Red Army that we were prepared to defend as they came west went east, gone. The unification of Germany, something we thought would take years, happened in just a matter of months. The Iron Curtain, gone. Cold War, gone. Last Thursday in Berlin, the Allied troops folded their flags and left. The last vestigial remains of that conflict. A few days earlier than last Thursday, Mr. Yeltsin was in Berlin to say goodbye to the Russian troops who were leaving. And in one memorable expression, he said to the assembled crowd, today is the last day of the past. With all these things gone, containment went. This wonderful strategy we had for all those decades, having nobly served its purpose, was gone too, leaving us without a unifying systems theory of the world. And in January, of 1992, we started that year with the Soviet Union gone, having collapsed a few days earlier on Christmas Day, 1991, and also gone my old friend, Mr. Gorbachev. Pushed aside. Why? Because he was a revolutionary reformer, but a reformer. He thought you could reform the Soviet Union and communism, but you cannot reform the loss of a value system. You cannot reform a situation where people have lost faith in their system. So having played his historic role, he went away from the scene and was replaced by a real revolutionary, Boris Yeltsin. Don't feel too badly about my friend, Mr. Gorbachev. He's on the speaking circuit here in the United States with me. And Bill, if you're looking for 96 or 5. Incredibly, last year, we celebrated the 250th anniversary of the birth of Thomas Jefferson. And celebrations were held at the College of William and Mary, where Jefferson had graduated, and over at the University of Virginia, which was his creation. But at the major celebration of William and Mary, this, I mean, this wellspring of democracy, Jeffersonian, Virginian democracy, who can we get to speak at such an occasion? Who could be up to such a democratic occasion? They went and got Mikhail Gorbachev. <laughs> Is this a great country or what? <laughs> I was free that day. I could have done it. <laughs> this second part of my career has not been easy. <laughs> in the absence of containment, in the absence of a systems theory, the world. We have to start creating one. And our first most important task deals with Russia and the other former republics of the Soviet Union, this marvelous land of 11 time zones with more natural resources than any other nation on the face of the earth. 
with an educated population, with scientists of the first order. They are without an economic system at the moment. They are without a political system at the moment. We have to help them. We have to keep pushing them and assisting them down this road toward creating a democratic system of government and creating a free market system of economics. Their first task is to put underneath both of those a body of law, has to become a nation of law, and we have to do everything we can to help them. That is our first order of business. The change we saw in the Soviet Union and the Eurasian landmass is typical of changes that are happening in other parts of the world for the same sorts of reasons. The triumph of certain kinds of values, people tiring of conflict and confrontation, and an increasing desire around the world for reconciliation on the basis of respect for each other. If I had told you, for example, more than a year or so ago that in September of 1993, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin of Israel would be in the South Lawn of the White House with Yasser Arafat of the PLO, and they would sign an agreement recognizing each other and shake hands. It would have been unthinkable. And yet there they were, and we all saw it by television. I was privileged to be in the front row watching this incredible event when they finally reached over, you remember, and touched, shook hands. After the ceremony, they came off the stage and they walked along the front row of dignitaries, and when my old friend Mr. Rabin came by, we'd done a number of things together over the years, he recognized me and saw me, and he gave me one of those smiles that only a New York City boy really understands. You know, he gave me a smile that said, Colin, can you believe what I just did with this guy? <laughs> hmm. And then my new friend, Mr. Arafat, came along. And he saw me and recognized me and he stuck his hand out. Well, everybody was shaking hands with everybody, so I grabbed his hand and shook it. And he tried to extend the courtesy by pulling me toward him. I'm going to do one of these. No, I cannot handle too much New World Order in one day. <laughs> the next day, Mr. Arafat, to show you how the world, the next day, Mr. Arafat's all over Capitol Hill, congressmen falling all over themselves. He's on every talk show imaginable. He's on everything except Oprah. He's, he's all over the place, and he's having a great time. And finally, one skeptical reporter decides to take a, a shot at his head. Well, Mr. Arafat, it was nice of you not to wear your gun to the White House yesterday, but why did you go in a uniform of all things? And Arafat says, well, uh, why not? General Powell was there in his uniform. A few months left to go, and I have to serve as a fashion model for an old terrorist. <laughs> In July of this year, you saw that process continued when Mr. Rabin signed the agreements with King Hussein of Jordan, second piece of the puzzle. There can be no doubt, I think, at least there's no doubt in my mind, that in due course, within a year, the third piece will be there when Assad of Syria joins the party. Who would have believed just a few years ago that this kind of reconciliation would be taking place? If I had said to you a year or so ago that the Nobel Peace Prize winners for 1993 would be Nelson Mandela and F.W. de Klerk of South Africa, and they would get the Peace Prize for finally ridding the earth of that horror of apartheid, that would have been difficult to believe. But they did. They did. They reconciled. They realized that continued conflict was not serving anyone's interest and it was not for the welfare of South Africa. I was privileged once again to be part of the U.S. delegation to the inauguration of Nelson Mandela in Pretoria. Remarkable day when all the leaders of the world were assembling and I'm just a retired guy hanging around. And for three hours I circled in this crowd listening to wonderful music and watching everybody assemble talking to people, and then a few minutes before the ceremony began, the heads of state started to arrive. And I just stood there, and suddenly, 25 feet away, there was Fidel Castro. Oh, God. <laughs> I 
But by so doing, I ran 50 feet in front of me, eye contact with my new friend, Mr. Arafat, who, who sees me and he goes, so I cannot take anymore. So no, no, Mr. Fidel Castro. So I went to say hello to Mr. Arafat. And uh, he was behind a row of chairs. His charming young wife was with him. And there were, there were a whole battery of cameras watching this. And so I reached over the chairs, tried to say hello to his wife, shaking hands and saying something all at the same time, lost balance. <clears throat> <laughs> the cameras the cameras went off like a machine gun. <laughs> a wonderful color picture appeared in a few obscure California newspapers. Okay. <laughs> but who would have believed it? Who would have believed it? The announcer said, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the new first vice president of the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Mbeki, and a black man went up. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the new second vice president of the new Republic of South Africa, and Mr. F.W. de Klerk, the man who had been president a few moments earlier, went up on the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Nelson Mandela, the new president of the new Republic of South Africa. Before Nelson Mandela appeared on the stage, four white South African generals came before him as a guard of honor and then took their position to the rear of the stage and waited for their new president to be inaugurated. Incredible. Incredible. But it happened. That kind of change is taking place in other parts of the world. Here, in our hemisphere, all of the nations of this hemisphere, with two exceptions, are under democratic rule. Haiti, and we hope that will change very shortly, and Cuba. And there can be no doubt that Cuba is heading to the ash heap of history with respect to its political system. And it, too, will fall in the right column. The reason for that is that it is the wave of the future. It is where the future is heading. But then you could say to me, each and every one of you, well, General, if this is such a time of hope, if this is such a time of promise, if this is such a time of historic change that you're talking about, why is it that every night what we see in our television set, not all these promising things, but war and violence and clashes and starvation and horrible things? We see Somalia and Rwanda and, and North Korean nuclear weapons and Haiti and Cuba. So explain that. And the explanation is that history is taking two roads. One road, the nations I've described earlier, are moving down toward worrying about a better life for their people, a life based on political systems that increasingly revolve around not confrontation, not the clash or meeting of armies at some border, but rely upon trade and economics and the flow of information and the ability to participate in a rapidly growing global economy. But down that other road, that second road, there are still nations that want to fight 500-year-old grudges that do not yet realize that they are on the wrong side of history. And each and every one of these will be different. We have no unifying systems theory any longer. No president has a theory that will cover Haiti and Rwanda, Bosnia and Somalia, North Korea and the Sudan. Each and every one of them will have to be dealt with individually and very often on an ad hoc basis. And we will have to have some patience with our national leaders as they work their way through each of these crises. Almost none of them will involve a national vital interest. There is nothing left on the face of the earth, with one exception, that can threaten our national survival any longer. And that one exception are the residual nuclear weapons in Russia. But that is of little concern to us because of the change political situation, and eventually we can get those much reduced. So we don't have a vital interest at stake in any of these places. We have perhaps a regional interest, as we do in North Korea or in the Middle East, and very often what we have is a moral interest, where as the leader of the world that would be free, we have to respond to moral outrage. 
which is what we have done in a lot of our humanitarian operations, what we did in Somalia, and to some extent, what we may have to do if we cannot avoid it in Haiti. In each, we will have to weigh our interests. But there's one thing I am absolutely sure of, and I saw this everywhere I went for the seven years of this second part of my career. America will have to remain engaged. We will have to be the leader of this world that wants to be free. There is no substitute for American leadership. But let me tell you why, in very simple terms, the answer that I get when I ask the question of my foreign friends in any part of the world. The answer is we are trusted like no other nation on the face of the earth. And people say to me, you fought two world wars. You left tens of thousands of your youngsters dead here. And yet when those wars were over, when you were at the pinnacle of political and military power, the only two things you asked for was first the opportunity to raise up your enemies, and the second thing you asked for was the land that you needed to bury your dead. Who else can be trusted like this? What other nation, what other people, what other value system can be trusted like this? The debates about NATO and who should be in NATO or not in NATO are interesting but secondary. The important thing is NATO will continue even if it doesn't have an enemy any longer. And the reason NATO will continue because all the Europeans want it. Well, why do all the Europeans want it if there is no longer an enemy for NATO? And the answer is simple. NATO means America. NATO means the continuing political and military presence of the United States of America and the continent of Europe can't be left to themselves. We look to the West, to America, for our continued security in this post-Cold War world, they tell me, as we did during the days of the Cold War. From time to time, in discharging our leadership responsibilities, the armed forces of the United States will have to go in harm's way. During my years as chairman, I followed some pretty straightforward rules in giving advice to my political leaders as to the rules and circumstances or guidelines they should look at when committing the armed forces of the United States. First, make sure you have a clear political objective. No fuzziness, no fooling around. What is it you are politically trying to achieve? We do not go to war to achieve military objectives. That's the tactics of it. War is a political act, therefore you have to have a political objective that you feel military means can accomplish. And I have sometimes not been well received when I have forced that question to be answered. The second point I've always made to my political leaders as their principal military advisor if and when young sons and, sons and daughters of American parents are sent in harm's way, they got to be prepared well, know what they're doing, and they've got to be given a mission that produces decisive results so they can win. Don't send them in unless you're planning to do something decisive. Their lives are too valuable. And third, make sure you know how you're going to get out of this. Make sure you understand the exit strategy before you come up with an entry decision. I think those are good rules to follow. We saw the first test of our resolve and our willingness to be leaders in the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq back in 1990. And in response to that, one of your previous speakers and a dear friend of ours, George Bush, perhaps made uh, one of the most difficult political decisions he ever made and that was to respond to that invasion and put together a grand coalition to reverse that aggression if the Iraqis would not pull out voluntarily as a result of sanctions. And your great friend and mine, Norm Schwarzkopf, took 541,000 Americans and hundreds of thousands of other coalition troops, went 8,000 miles away from our shores and won that war. We achieved all the political objectives that were set out. Get the Iraqis out of Kuwait, they're gone put the Kuwaiti regime back in, they are, bring a sense of stability to the region, we did, leading the way to the peace process that we now see unfolding between Mr. Rabin and his former enemies in the region. So in terms of our political objectives, Desert Storm was a complete success, and it was a military success in that we did not have any unnecessary or excessive loss of life because we did it well. Norm and I have been answering questions for years. Yeah, but you didn't get Sodom. 
He's still there. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. He's still there, but he is well under control by the United Nations and their inspection regime. And like all other tyrants, don't worry about Saddam Hussein. Like a kidney stone, he will pass in due course. <laughs> Desert Storm, Desert Storm is something else. It was more than a political victory and a military victory. It was a victory of the spirit. America responded in a way to that conflict that was quite remarkable. You fell in love with those youngsters. You, you showed a sense of pride and patriotism in what you were seeing that was uh, incredible. You threw parades that we thought would never end. And I never expected anything like that to happen. Never expected it. But I got a sensing of it the first night. The first night of the war was the most difficult one for me because I knew what the plan was. I knew every target, what planes were going there, what missiles were going there, how long it would take, how long it would take to get back to the carriers and the air bases, get the reports in, get the reports to Norm. Norm calls me to tell me what's going on. So I paced my office waiting. And and, and watching the sequence play out in my mind. And then finally, after a terminable period, Norm calls. Ring. Yeah, Norm. Colin, we're off to a great start. We've only lost one airplane, and it was an accident off one of the aircraft carriers. No other plane's been shot down. None? None. Get good target coverage. We're off to a great start. Norm, that's terrific. Congratulations. Tell all the guys I'm proud of them. Now let's get it going. And I hung the phone up and I took a deep breath and then I turned on CNN to see what was really going on, you know? <laughs> Norm's my buddy, but you know, I, you know, I gotta see what's going on here. And the real reason I turned on CNN is because you were on CNN. If I would ask for a show of hands, anybody who was near a television set that night was watching CNN. It was a mass national experience. And I knew what was going on in the war. I had Norm to take care of that and tell me from time to time. At this point, that war was going well. I had to see what was happening with this mass national experience and how it would affect our ability to conduct the war as the casualties started to come in later. And you remember that night with my three CNN buddies in the Rashid Hotel, Peter Arnett, and Bernie Shaw. Oh, look at that. Oh, boy, look at missiles. There goes one now. Carrying on. And I kept, I kept looking at my target list. Isn't that damn hotel here somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> that is a joke. The images you saw of wonderful young men and women, professional, well-trained, patriotic, proud, drug-free, no Generation X, and they were alcohol-free, thank heavens, because we were in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Marvelous. I got a sensing of it as morning broke, and the reporters were dying to get something on camera to feed the machine to feed this 24-hour-a-day television monster. And so one of the F-16s came in for a landing at an air base, and we allowed television crews on the air base. And this one television crew was chasing this young pilot that just got out of his F-16. What was it like? Tell me, tell me. Come on, we got to know. American people want to know what it was like. Well, the youngster's 24 years old, fire plug of a kid, helmet off, hair matted, perspiration coming down a little pale, the adrenaline flowing out of him, G-suit constraining him. He doesn't want to talk to anybody. First mission, safely, successfully. But his training kicked in. And he's, as he's walking away from the reporter, he looks over his shoulder and he starts to talk. And I go, oh, oh boy. <laughs> and the youngster says, well, I'll tell you. First, I want to thank God that I got home safely from my first mission and I was successful on my first mission. He takes a couple of steps, and then he looks over his shoulder, and he says to the reporter, I want to thank God for the love of a good woman.
He takes another couple of steps and he looks over at his shoulder and he says, I thank God I'm an American. And then I said, well, what more can this kid give me? <laughs> and then he takes another couple of steps, and there's one captain in the room who will appreciate this. He takes another couple of steps and looks over his shoulder and he says, I thank God I'm an American fighter pilot. And I went, yay! <laughs> You saw that kind of youngster. You saw Major Rhonda Cornham, wife, mother, soldier, surgeon, helicopter pilot. And then Rhonda became a prisoner of war when her evacuation helicopter was shot down going in after a less fortunate F-16 pilot a few days later. And you remember Rhonda coming home with her arms across her chest at Andrews Air Force Base because they had been seriously injured to be greeted by her daughter. You may have seen a Sam Donaldson piece, Sam being one of the best in the business, and Sam said he wanted to go talk to some ground troops just before the war. Enough of this Nintendo Air Force stuff, Powell. I want to go talk to the guys who are going to do the dirty work, see how they feel. So he went to a tank platoon of the 1st Armored Division. And he goes up to some officers. They're in the desert. Well, Captain, how do you think it's going to go? Well, sir, I am quite confident that we will perform our mission with, uh, with uh, great, uh, uh, great uh, success and uh, uh, everything will go exceptionally well. That's the way officers talk. And uh, then he goes up to a sergeant. Sergeant, what do you think? Ain't no problem. We're going that way and we're going home. <laughs> That's the way sergeants talk. You get closer to the ground truth, the further you get away from the officers. And then finally, Sam said, now nah, I'm going to talk to the privates. And there are a group of privates out there, about 10 of them. And they were white and black and Hispanic, and their, their colors and their accents all merged into that great nationality and language we know as American. And Sam zeroes in on one young African-American private, young black private, sitting on a case of rations. And his buddies are standing behind him, and they're all babbling until the camera kind of focuses in on the young black soldier, and they quiet down, and Sam says, well, son, what do you think it's going to be like? And the youngster says, Mr. Donaldson, uh, I'm not afraid. We, we're well trained. We know what we have to do. We've got to go do this battle so we can go home. But the real reason I'm not afraid is uh, I'm with family. It's my family. They're my family. And the young soldiers behind him started to chant that chant that became popular at that time. hoo Yeah! Tell him again, he didn't hear you. He didn't hear you. Tell him again. It's my family. We take care of each other. We're going to be fine because we're family. We're going to take care of each other. You saw that and you responded to that. I've seen that tape many times. I told the story many times. Every time I see that tape and every time I see that story, I say, how could this 18-year-old have captured so vividly what we are all about? American family, people who care about each other, people who believe in a value system, people who believe in themselves, people who believe that this nation is blessed by some divine providence. It is that value system, it is that spirit, it is that belief which allowed that young private and his buddies and his hundreds of thousands of other buddies win in Desert Storm, and it is that same system which won the Cold War. It is that same system which people around the world trust and are expecting us to continue to show to the world as the leader of this world that would be free. And it is that same value system, that same belief in family, that we have to somehow regenerate in every community, every school, every workplace, every activity of endeavor back here in America where we still have problems, problems that are in our ability and our capacity to solve, but we're not doing it yet. We have to return throughout this country to a system of values where we're not screaming at each other from the left and the right, where we're beginning to respect each other again more, when we appreciate diversity as a source of our strength and not a source of our weakness, when we begin to love one another, when we begin to restore a sense of shame my mother could cut me off in the knees by saying, Colin, I'm ashamed to you. We've got to put that back in schools and families, our belief in standards. 
I believe we can do that. I believe that spirit exists here tonight. I believe that spirit exists throughout the country. But there are still places of darkness in this country. And we all, as Americans, have to work on that. Stop shouting at each other. Get to work on raising up this entire country. I know we can do it. I wouldn't be American if I didn't believe we can do it. We can do it because we are citizens of the greatest country on earth, a place that God has so richly, richly blessed, and we are so very, very proud to call America. Thank you. You know, I lived a certain life and a certain code for 35 years as a soldier, which essentially said you do not have any political aspirations, you do not have any political positions or biases. You are bipartisan. And I even was able to keep that code while working in both Democratic White Houses and Republican White Houses, and even working as in, in a political situation such as National Security Advisor. So it's a very strongly held code with me. But uh, I came out from under that a year ago. And in the last year, I, I have traveled widely around the country, trying to learn about the country, learning about things that have nothing to do with the Pentagon or with the military, so that I can start to develop uh, views on all of the issues that are facing our country and not just security issues. Uh, that process is underway. And in due course, uh, it may lead me to a conclusion as to uh, where I am politically. Uh, at that point, I don't know what I will do. There is no passion in me to join the political fray. And I think you have to have that passion. There is a passion in me to be of some service to the nation uh, after I finish my memoirs, either in charitable work or educational work, perhaps occasional missions like the one I'm going on tomorrow, perhaps in appointed office. I do not rule out a political future but I've got to learn a lot more about the country and about myself. And uh, I would only go into politics if I felt that I truly had something to offer um, the American people that is, that is not available elsewhere. So I'm keeping all options open. Ken? Yeah. In Somalia in, in December of 92, um, the situation was so horrible, really November, the day before Thanksgiving, 1992, the situation had deteriorated so badly. Uh, the suffering was so bad, the dying was so bad, that President Bush asked us to take a hard look at it. We gave him a plan that said, you know, let's do it the right way. The UN is fooling around with a few hundred guys. Let's send in 28,000, fix the thing, humanitarian-wise and then uh, turn it back over to the UN. He said, do it. We did it. We, we scared the devil out of it. Remember the seals coming across the beach with CNN showing them? Yeah, I, mean, I laughed. I thought that, you know, the seals weren't happy, but I laughed. Because I want, we didn't want to kill any Somalians. We wanted to scare them. Ain't nothing scarier than a seal on CNN. And Somalians said, hey, you guys want to talk? We'll talk. Yeah, we'll talk. So that's what we did. And within weeks, the dying had stopped. And within a few months, we had taken control of the whole country for humanitarian purposes. And I, had, I went to Somalia in April of 93 and confirmed the turnover to the UN. We then lost the bubble in the summer, beginning in June of 93. We, we lost sight of our objective. And that's why I feel so strongly about such matters and that we got into nation building in a place where there was no nation. We talked about rebuilding institutions that didn't exist in the first place. We thought we were going to show these people who had been solving their own problems for a thousand years their way, how to solve it our way. And that was a big mistake. And we tried to get a thorough review of the policy at that time. And we did not succeed. And then I retired. And then three days later, there was the uh, big firefight in Somalia. and then. The president and his team took a hard look at the policy and came out, which was the decision that should have been made months early, but we were unable to get made. Um, it's
classic case of losing sight of your objective using fuzzy words and fuzzy terms and fuzzy concepts that are not translatable down to the young private sergeant who has to get it done. Um, the current crisis before us, uh, being run by officers who I know well, uh, some might say they have uh, studied under me, um, I had some, you know, I'm very confident that the commanders who are putting together the plan for Haiti, should it be necessary to use that plan, uh, have learned their lessons well. If they haven't, then I've failed. I have time for one more, then I think I have to go. Yes, sir, right in the back. I have a hard time conjuring up threats the way we used to for this first part of my life. The world has so fundamentally changed that, in my judgment, we will continue to need a strong armed force just because we are a superpower and there will always be a level of uncertainty out there. But for the foreseeable future, unless the political environment that, that I see changes fundamentally, I do not see the emergence of a major military threat. Nor is there any country or grouping, grouping of countries out there who could create such a threat without us seeing it and having enough time, if we make the right political decisions, to respond to it. What I see happening uh, is that people are going to fight us in the global marketplace. China is a great example. Market economics are taking hold on the coastal regions. We'll be moving inland. The poor old guys in Beijing smoking those unfiltered cigarettes and using spittoons will in due course pass away and be replaced by more moderate people. So the Chinese have economic reform taking place and trying to keep it un in check uh, with political centralization. And when economic reform is solidified, there can be no question it will force political change. And it will become a more democratic system, I think. Not like ours, but more democratic. And those democracies are going to be competing in the marketplace, in the information, on the information battlefield. And the structures of the future are going to be around things like expanded NAFTA, GATT, other kinds of trading arrangements that I don't even know the acronyms for yet, and less on old-fashioned Cold War security institutions of the kind represented by NATO and other bilateral military agreements. This is not to say we have seen the end of war. War has not gone away. But the kind of threat environment we are in will be fundamentally different from that which we have gotten used to. And one of the most difficult problems I had as chairman was shaking the military leaders into tossing away the old assumptions and thinking about the future in a different way. What I tried to do was to put the armed forces in a position where we kept certain capability. We need to be this big and we need to have these capabilities just because we're America, just because we can afford it, and just because there is that uncertainty out there. Well, who do you want to fight? We want to know who the enemy is so we can see whether you got, you're spending too much money on it. Uh, and I refused to buy into that argument because my enemies were disappearing too rapidly. You know, the, remember the old one, what will all the preachers do when the devil has been saved? Well, I was losing all my devils. And I had to uh, shift to capability. So our strategy for the future, keep a certain level of military capability for a threat that we don't see, uh, but that could pop up. And the other reason you keep it is to deter, deter anybody from creating such a threat because they know they can't beat us. If we put it all down and forget about it, then somebody's liable to take, you know, maybe I can take a little chance with America. But if we look strong, be strong, and uh, look like we're willing to use our power, there are, there are very few nations in the world who are going to challenge us militarily when they can undersell us in the global marketplace. That's where the real competition lies. Thank you very much.